All right. Welcome everyone to the Inside the Off Act webinar. In just a minute, we're going to dive in to hear all about the Off Fossil Fuels for a Better Future Act. I'm Katie Kiefer with Food and Water Watch, and we have a fantastic lineup of speakers with us tonight who I'll introduce in just a moment. Before that, just a quick orientation if you're joining us on Zoom. This would be a good time to mention that uh, if you aren't joining us on screen share, we highly recommend doing that by clicking the link in your email. We're all here on video and we'll be sharing slides throughout the webinar. Well, we will also be keeping everyone on mute to cut down on background noise, but we will be taking questions. If you have a question at any point in the presentation, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get um, to as many of those as we can at the end of the webinar. I'll also note that we will not be using the raise, raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. So again, click Q&A if you wanna ask a question. And if you have any technical issues or if you're just joining us over the phone and you have any questions, you can email us at help at fwaction.org. That's help, H-E-L-P, at F as in food, W as in water, A-C-T-I-O-N.org. And with that, let's uh, dive in. We'll kick things off with some introductions and then I'll pass it off to our panelists for tonight. So, uh, to start, we have Scott Edwards. Uh, Scott is the co-director of the Climate and Energy Program and Food and Water Justice Project with Food and Water Watch. Food and Water Watch champions healthy food, clean water, and a livable climate for all. We stand up to corporations that put profits before people, and we advocate for a democracy that improves people's lives and protects our environment. Prior to getting his law degree and entering the practice of environmental law, Scott taught ecology and environmental sciences to New York City high school students, and he's based in New York. Next, we have Fernando Losada. He's the National Collective Bargaining Director with National Nurses United, where he also directs the union's environmental health and climate justice work. NNU is the nation's largest organization of direct care RNs and is a stalwart advocate for social, environmental, and healthcare justice. Andrea Miller is the executive director of People Demanding Action, a multi-issue advocacy group. Her issues include climate justice, voting rights, Medicare, Medicare for all, trade, and the Equal Rights Amendment. Andrea is both a community organizer and a digital advocacy expert. She's on the steering committee of Interfaith Moral Action on Climate and hosted the Progressive Roundtable. And in 2008, Andrea was the Democratic nominee for Congress from Virginia's fourth district. And we have Ben Ishibashi, climate justice organizer with People's Action. Since 2015, he has been building power with People's Action to put working class people and people of color at the center of state, local, and national energy, environmental, and climate policy. Ben is currently working on a national people and planet first program dedicated to building the power to address the climate crisis and the structurally racist economic system that has gotten us into this mess. So thank you all uh, to our panelists for the great work that you do every day and for being with us tonight. And with that, I'll, well, let's get started. I'll pass it off to Scott Edwards, Edwards. Food Water Watch to kick us off. Great, thanks so much, Katie, and, and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, this is, a, as you all know, I'm sure, a, an extremely critical issue that we're facing with, with climate change. It is the most critical threat um, that, that we have right now to the continued existence of life on Earth. And, uh, you know, we've all read all the reports about how dire and, and what an urgent situation this is. And I think every day we're, we're seeing new reports that it is even more urgent than what we've been hearing. Um, so this is an issue that, that we have to take on. We don't have a choice. Um, we can't sit back and, and um, let this play out in the way it is playing out now under the current administration, under our current energy policy. So it's, it's, it's so important that you're here, that you're engaged. And, and again, I want to thank you for being here. Um, we um, uh, have been working very hard on, on climate and energy at Food and Water Watch. And um, last uh, summer, um, throughout actually the spring and into the summer, worked very closely with um, Tulsi Gabbard in, in the House um, to help craft a, a very important uh, and, and vital um, renewable energy bill called the OFF Act. Um, for short, um, it's the OFF Fossil Fuels for a Better Future Act, as Katie said. Um, it is uh, House Bill number 3671, and it was introduced in um, September of 2017 by Tulsi. And currently it has 23 co-sponsors in the house and we're, we're actively working to get more co-sponsors and build support for this. 
Um, we, we know that this is a, a bill that's going to take some time to pass, certainly given the current structure of, of Congress. Um, so we're going to continue to build support, continue to build sponsors, and again, your help is, is going to be very important as we do this. Uh, my role here tonight is to just to touch very briefly, we don't have a lot of time, so I want to touch very briefly on some of the main points of, of the bill. And there'll be a question and answer period at the end. If you want to get into more detail, I can't get into all the details, but I do want to touch on some of the most important provisions. Um, number one is, of course, the, the clean energy mandate. Um, you've, you've read a lot about different renewable bills and different renewable targets. Um, the OFF Act is a, is a very aggressive bill. It demands that we generate 100% of our electricity from renewable sources by 2035. Um, now, there are two wrinkles on this that I want to touch on. Number one is we have a very, very strong definition of renewable in this bill. Um, it doesn't include things that are often listed as renewable under state plans or other, other um, renewable energy approaches. Uh, our renewable energy definition is just wind, solar, tidal ocean, and geothermal. It doesn't have biogas in it. Um, we don't consider that to be a clean source of energy. Um, so we have a very strict definition of what is renewable. We have a very strong 100% by 2035 goal. And, and I think even more importantly, uh, you know, getting to 100% by 2035 isn't going to save this planet from some of the worst impacts of climate change. So what we've done is we've built in an even more aggressive, shorter term benchmark of 80% renewable by 2027. Now that's when we, when we passed this bill, that was 10 years away, but the next 10 years are absolutely critical if we're gonna save this planet. We can't afford to hold off and then go to 100% renewable 20 years from now or, or even towards 2035. We need to front load our reductions, get them done quickly. So we've built in that benchmark, that 27, 2027 benchmark into this off act to make sure we do this quickly. Um, in order to achieve that, we're going to have to act now. And so the OFF Act calls for an immediate moratorium on new fossil fuel projects. We have to stop this infrastructure build out that we're now engaged in. Um, we have to stop subsidizing this industry. Uh, so it also ends fossil fuel subsidies immediately. Um, it stops uh, the massive amount of, of exports that are going on. A lot of our infrastructure that we're building right now is not for domestic use. This is all for for fossil fuels to be shipped overseas. This is pure profit for these companies. So it puts an end to exports. Um, we are very much aware and during dr drafting this bill, we, we worked with a lot of different groups, environmental justice groups and labor organizations and others, a wide range of, of groups to make sure that this bill adequately addresses uh, just transition, for example. Um, we know that the shift from fossil fuels to renewables is going to have a huge economic impact on fossil fuel workers, on environmental justice communities, on struggling frontline communities. Um, and so what we've done is we've built into this bill protections and funding and awareness, um, job training. Um, it calls for the creation of a center for clean energy and workforce development, which provides for training, relocation, um, lots of different protections, a big focus on the environmental justice community. Um, we, we understand the disparate impacts that, that this shift will have. Um, so it has much in the way of just transition and environmental justice provisions. And again, I get into details if you, if you, ask, if you want to ask questions about this at the end. Um, there's funding mechanisms in, in here. I, I talked about um, the end of um, subsidies on fossil fuels uh, uh, industries. And um, that's certainly a massive amount of money that we spend on subsidizing that industry. And so we can take that money and put it into these just transition and environmental justice protections as part, and the OFF Act calls for that. Um, th there are other, we now, since we've, uh, Past this bill, we we're facing this, this disaster of a tax uh, policy that's been enacted. So we're going to have to go back and revisit some of our funding and come up with other funding streams, certainly, as we work on this bill and, and begin to amend it. Um, but certainly, this, this, will, this will demand funding, and the funding will be coming um, to provide, again, for that, that job training and for that environmental justice. Um, the other critical point that I want to talk about of this bill is we see a lot in this country now at the state level, some talk at the federal level, 
of addressing climate change through various pricing mechanisms, whether it's a cap and trade system, um, there's cap and trade in California, there's cap and trade being discussed in Oregon, um, Virginia now is talking about joining a cap and trade system called REGI. Um, there's talk of carbon taxes in Washington, D.C. and Maryland. Um, we don't adhere to carbon pricing and market-based systems to address pollution and climate change. Um, for us, those are neoliberal approaches um, that never end well, quite frankly, and um, only go to create more inequity um, in this country and don't result in the kinds of reductions. We don't think they result in any reductions, quite frankly, uh, from, the, from the programs we've looked at. Um, the California cap and trade program, for example, is having uh, many covered industry sectors are actually increasing emissions of pollution into frontline communities by buying up credits. Um, so this, this, unlike many other bills you may see, does not allow for pricing, cap and trade, market-based neoliberal, neoliberal approaches to, to um, carbon pollution. These are mandates. We know how to clean up pollution. We did it with the Clean Water Act. We've done it with the Clean Air Act. And it's a requirement on industry that you adhere to uh, standards. And, um, and this bill doesn't allow you to buy your way out of pollution. Um, we also understand that um, the, uh, given the current federal um, situation we're in on, uh, within Congress, um, that it's, it's critical to act at the state level as well as the federal level. Um, so uh, we have been working, Food and Water Watch with our allies have been working very strongly on state-based off acts. And in current state, as you know, the, the, the state uh, legislative cycles for most states are kicking in now. Um, but right now we are um, promoting and working on some state-based off acts in Maryland, Virginia, New York, New Jersey, and Colorado. And all of those state bills are modeled largely on the federal bill calling for the same mandates, 100% um, by 2035. New York's actually a little more aggressive, it's 100% by 2030. Uh, interim uh, aggressive benchmarks, uh, just transition, environmental justice protections. Um, so um, it, this is a, a very um, ag aggressive bill, um, but it has to be. Um, we, are, we are facing a very aggressive climate change problem. And uh, I know that um, much of the criticism we face is that um, there are a lot of technological hurdles, there's certainly political hurdles that we all have to face. Um, this is not an easy task, and that's why it's so important for you all to be involved. We're gonna have to do this together. Um, but, but you know, for those who, who say that this is such a heavy lift and how are we gonna get this done, I mean, I always like to, to think back um, uh, when, when JFK back in 1962 showed up at a university in Texas and announced, we're all gonna go to the moon in this decade. You know, people looked at him like he was crazy. Um, and they said, that's, that's just not gonna happen. And his response during his speech was, we choose to go to the moon in this decade, decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energy and skills because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. And I think that's the same type of approach we need to do with this renewable energy. We don't have a choice. We can't move to the moon. Um, we don't have another planet to go to. Um, so we all have to work hard, and, and, and if we work hard and we do this and we build a political power and political will, we can do this in, in the 2035 timeframe that we've laid out. And with that, I'll turn it over to the next panelist. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, great. So next we have Fernando from National Nurses United. Hi, good evening, everybody. Pleasure to be here with you all. I'm Fernando Lasada. I'm with National Nurses United. Um, very proud to say a, a member of the AFL-CIO uh, labor union in this country, but also one that is uh, very, very deeply committed uh, to this question of um, getting off fossil fuels and um, uh, transitioning in a just way uh, 
the energy system, uh, the political system, the political changes that will require it, and of course, uh, industrially speaking, for the workers involved. For us, it's a it's a natural fit because um, our members deal with the human fallout of environmental injustice and the climate crisis, and our allied uh, nurses unions across the world face this. They see it. They understand it. Some people would say it's easy for us, and I wouldn't deny that. I mean. Um, it's a, it's a natural fit for a nurses union to be a champion of this question, um, this issue. Um, but um, uh, it, uh, it, that is not to say that uh, we don't have a stake in this. A lot of times um, unions in the carbon intensive industries will say that, you know, no one else has the right to speak on this issue because um, uh, we're not uh, directly affected. It's not our industry. Uh, that's certainly the, uh, the um, uh, the claims that were made, say, at the last AFL-CIO convention, where we were attacked for forwarding um, a, uh, a climate resolution. Um, uh, but we do have a stake. It's our work. It's uh, the patients that we take care of that suffer, and um, we, it's we're directly invested in trying to solve this problem as a health crisis. Um, so that said, I want to speak more broadly, and I was asked to speak more broadly about labor and the role of labor um, in uh, backing this um, legislation and also explain, tease out a little bit, um, uh, how the labor questions are addressed in the legislation. Um, uh, uh, the and I, I can say, and I, I, uh, the previous panelist laid it out as well, the question of just transition is addressed in a way that has never been addressed in any other legislation. If you look at the elements of it, incorporated here in this, in this piece of legislation are the most progressive demands of the labor movement uh, going back decades, as articulated um, very clearly and well uh, in the 90s um, during the Labor Party efforts um, championed by Tony Mazzocchi himself. Um, the same demands that were uh, articulated then are actually um, laid out in this legislation. But let me come back to that, if I may, in a quick second. I want to say that um, as far as the labor movement itself, history would, would, I think, back me up, and I think we all understand that major social reforms, like what we're talking about here, major structural reforms in society, uh, are difficult, if not impossible to achieve without the institutional support of organized labor, of the organized working class. Um, at the same time, more specifically in this industry, it's hard to see, it's hard to imagine a scenario where we prevail in the United States politically um, against the powers of the uh, amassed against us by the fossil fuel industry um, and, and the financial sector that's uh, behind it. Um, when the workers themselves in that industry are in league against us, with the employer against us. That is a problem that we must solve if we're ever to succeed. So I think that's, you know, the, um, I think we're, um, we understand that probably most of the people on this call understand it. I know the, uh, the folks that worked on this legislation and now this coalition that um, uh, that uh, Food and Water Watch is playing such a key role in, in, in building behind the legislation, we understand that we've got to address this question. What about the workers in the carbon intensive, intensive industries? How do we have, uh, how do we create a situation? How do we organize a situation in which those folks are in league with this movement for transition and not with their employers in the name of preserving those those um, fossil fuel jobs, those carbon intensive jobs. That really to me is a key question, I, you know, that we could have a whole webinar just on that question. We're not doing that tonight, but I just want to lay that out and make sure, you know, that, um, you know, we're, we're wrestling with this um, uh, together. Now back to the legislation itself. Um, the legislation here includes um, very specific provisions around just transition, provides funding, provides extended unemployment, funds for retraining, uh, funds for relocation, et cetera, uh, a variety of mechanisms that were already uh, referred to, workforce development, uh, council, local uh, councils at the various levels, state level, to provide for inclusion of labor and other uh, 
uh, stakeholders, constituent constituency groups, indigenous communities, frontline communities, et cetera. All this is a good thing. That's something that workers unions have never really had. Um, this would provide for that um, with some significant funding. Uh, we throw around the term just transition a lot, but here in this legislation, we attempt to actually put some meat on the bones, some concrete elements of what that means. Um, I know that those of us that have worked on this issue within labor over the years, we talk about just transition, certainly going back, as I said, to the 90s, the Labor Party did, but it was always very vague. What does that mean? And I know from my friends and colleagues, progressives in the, um, it's a, in the, uh, in, that work in the refineries, it's laid off, you get fired, you lose your job, and then you, you know, you get some help to pick up the pieces. Well, this legislation attempts to deal with that on the front end. Um, and um, I, extremely importantly, not for just the individual worker, but for the labor unions themselves, this legislation includes, again, for the first time in any such legislation that I'm aware of, the concept of card checks. So workers that would qualify under this, um, uh, under the, 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 for benefits under this um, legislation by having been, by virtue of having been displaced, um, industries uh, affected by the transition. Um, the new jobs under this legislation will be required to have card check recognition, uh, which is again, another age old progressive labor demand so that we can actually unionize uh, quickly, fairly, without uh, so much employer interference. That would really change uh, the nature of things. Um, and it'd be very attractive to the labor unions if we can communicate this. Um, the other piece that's in there is once uh, the union is recognized, there's provisions in there specifically for collective bargaining. Bargaining within a certain time frame, the option for uh, actually mandatory ar arbitration uh, in there. So there would be a guarantee of actually getting a contract, half of all union elections that prevail, and that's it's, it's, it's difficult, extremely difficult. Half of them don't even achieve a first contract nowadays. So this would mean um, a, a smoother path, a, a much more direct path to organization, unionization, and actually winning a contract whereby workers would have a collective way to advocate for their, their, um, their needs and their interests having um, in, in, these, in the new uh, 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 renewable uh, sector. So that's a, that would be a profound achievement. And uh, I feel that if we can get this, th these, these pieces across to the labor movement, we will have a lot more allies and we'll, have, we'll be in a lot better position to uh, be actually in league with the workers themselves and in league uh, and have the institutional backing of the, uh, of the unions um, that represent those folks. That, and, and as well as other unions that would like to uh, represent the new burgeoning uh, renewable sector that will emerge. Um, this could be a very powerful thing. Um, the question of jobs is also, it's beyond a messaging question. We need to put meat on the bones. Um, it's, it's implied in the legislation. There's reference to the, uh, the uh, many more jobs that are ge generated in renewables than in um, old fossil fuel uh, sector, um, uh, three to one currently. I've seen studies uh, that uh, say, you know, dollar for dollar, it's 10 to one. Um, we need to communicate that as well. These are our challenges, I think, as organizers. It's not just a labor question, as I said at the outset. I don't see how we ever prevail and win this vital, essential, um, existentially uh, critical uh, uh, piece of legislation. Um, without uh, addressing the question of uh, having the institutional support of organized labor and of the workers themselves. Um, so I would, you know, I thank, thank you for uh, having me here. I appreciate folks uh, uh, listening. Um, this is a question not resolved. It's a direct in the legislation, but I think it's on us as organizers that care about environmental and climate justice. How do we uh, communicate? to uh, working people 
um, that will be affected and that could also benefit from the transition um, the, the essence of these um, provisions in the legislation for workers. Uh, critical question. So thank you for having me. And thanks for uh, beginning uh, to uh, allow this space so we can begin to address the question. Great. Thank you, Fernando. Just a reminder before we move on to our next couple of panelists, you can ask questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you're joining us on Zoom. If you are over the, uh, calling in over the phone, you can email us. The email is help at fwaction.org. And with that, we'll pass it off to Ben from People's Action. All right, um, so thank you again. Uh, my name is Ben, I'm with People's Action. I'm really excited to be here to be talking about the OFF Act for I mean, a, a whole slew of reasons, I mean, a number of which I've already been spoken about or that I'm sure Andrea will get to afterwards. Um, and, but just to kind of keep that focused a little bit more, I'm gonna really just con kind of concentrate on really how the OFF Act really, really aligns with how People's Action, you know, a, you know, a multiracial, multi-state organization of community-based organizations um, that organize on, on multiple issues um, around justice, um, how it really, really aligns well with, aligns well and really builds off of the work that we, both we've been doing, that organizations like us have been doing, that folks in, environment, in the like, traditional environmental justice movement have been doing for decades and not centuries before us. Um, and that's really comes down to our stake. Um, so ours, the reason that we as a national network, you know, that has historically, you know, predominantly been focused on economic and racial justice issues, um, really started to throw down and start building out a whole, you know, climate and environmental justice program and really make that a serious part of our long-term agenda uh, for progressive and radical change in this country um, is the fact that we, we, were starting, we just realized that, um, you know, climate change is not, not just about, you know, starving polar bears and melting ice caps um, and all the images that is most often associated with in the mainstream media and often in a lot of the communities that we organize in. Um, climate change and environmental degradation and more broadly in pollution, those issues are fundamentally about us. They're about working class people, about people of color who are forced to suffer disproportionate rates of asthma, of health disease, and death because they've been forced by a whole slew of structurally racist policies to live in areas where pollution is hyper-concentrated, where fossil fuel extraction, extraction is hyper-concentrated. And then on top of that, we have to deal with the same fact that our same communities, low-income folks, poor folks, and people of color around the world and in this country are, you know, again, because they are poor, because they are excluded by uh, society and in many ways oppressed, are the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So at the same time that the dirty energy economy is killing us, uh, we now have to deal with the second, you know, hydra of climate change hitting us first and worst. Um, so that's like really our stake in this. It's the fact that our members' lives and livelihoods really, really are at stake in the climate crisis, at stake in the, the broader crisis around uh, the environment. And that's why we're so excited to you know, be you know, entirely behind and part of this coalition uh, that's driving the OFF Act. Um, and I, I you know Fernando was talk talking about how a lot of the things that he was saying um, the nurses we're seeing in the Yacht Act are really unprecedented for labor. I think the same thing goes for us, for folks who are coming at us from a community organizing uh, perspective, for organizing in impact communities. Um, like we know that the reason that we have gotten into this crisis, the reason that our communities are in the situation that they're in is because we have not had the power or the resources to fight back or to demand that other solutions, that other systems be you know, set in place so that you know, we're not being forced to die and be sick and our communities aren't sacrificed. Um, and this bill, this act, con very concretely in a way that's much more radical than anything I expected to see potentially in my organizing career, um, definitely in this decade, really starts to address it in really concrete ways. So, um, if the, uh, so an earlier panelist has kind of mentioned how this bill creates a series of councils at the state, the federal, and the local level. I want to go a bit deeper into that because I think that's really, really important. So at the federal level, this, the FAAF Act creates a national council of folks from Native Hawaiian, Alaskan Native, Native American tribes, uh, low-income communities, people of color, um, their communities of color, um, environmental justice organizations, and folks from impacted communities more broadly. And so that's huge. Like, and if we had, like, we often talk about like what the world would look like if like uh, poor folks, if working folks, if people of color and Native folks, I've been at the table, uh, basically that got to design what the industrial revolution looked like. In many ways, this is kind of, this thought act is offering us a glimpse and a, a, 
a huge step towards us having that kind of influence over shaping what you know the next industrial revolution, the, the clean energy revolution looks like. Um, and about really making sure that that transition is A, just, and B, works, and works for our people. So that's, that's huge. Um, on top, and I think is one of the main reasons, kind of structurally and concretely, that we are so, um, so, so gung-ho and behind this bill. Uh, so, uh, beyond that, um, kind of even at a level of recognition, just in terms of how the OFF Act um, basically justifies itself in terms of listing the reasons for why we need this massive transformation, this massive radical structural shift in the US uh, economy, it names all of the facts that I would normally recite about environmental injustice and environmental racism in this country. It names the fact that black folks are 79% more likely to live in communities where the air is unhealthy or even deadly for them than white folks. It names the fact that two thirds of Latinos live in uh, counties where uh, the air does not meet the basic requirements of the Clean Air Act. It names the fact that you know over a quarter of the Superfund sites in this country are on uh, native uh, tribal land, despite the fact that that amount of land is like less than 4% of the total land in this country. Um, and it doesn't just name it, but it really uh, takes that justification seriously. It doesn't merely use this as a talking point, which has often happened to frontline communities, to environmental justice communities, and to people of color and workers you know, throughout history and across the board on multiple issues. But it actually starts through the councils, through um, some of the weatherization, low-income weatherization programs, through um, just the, the constant and consistent requirement that impacted folks, that working folks, that people of color, and that Native folks in particular be consulted and given real decision making and, and consulting uh, power at every single phase of how we transition off fossil fuels and start and transition into a clean energy economy. Um, and so that is huge. Um, I don't want to take up any more time because I know there's going to be a lot of questions and I want to make, leave as much time as possible for a really great discussion. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to the next panelist. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. Great. And again, if you have any questions, pop those in the Q&A uh, at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to those uh, as many as we can at the end of the webinar. And next up, and our last panelist is Andrea with People Demanding Action. Hey, thanks a lot, Katie. What I'm going to do is the old fashioned teacher in me. I'm going to share my screen and show you some things as we talk about building out and organizing and tracking what is going on with this legislation so we can move it forward. Um, back in 2013, um, People Demanding Action, well actually it was um, another organization then, we formed a coalition much like this one to fight the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So what I want to say first and foremost is this is definitely going to be a marathon. This is not going to be a sprint. So while we have our legislation, nobody is really dreaming or fantasizing that by the end of the year, we are going to pass this bill. What we do expect to be able to do is by the end of the year, have significantly more than our current 23 co-sponsors. And notice this bill is only in the House. In order for a bill to effectively pass, we're going to need the bill to be in the Senate. And right now, we had the bill introduced in five states. Well, there are 50. So you can get a feeling for the scope of work that is ahead of us. But as we saw with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, when we get a dedicated group of people working on something, whatever it is that they're working on, they are going to be able to achieve their goal. So what I'm gonna do right now is I am going to share my screen. That will take me just a moment. And I'm going to bring up my PowerPoint and walk you through my little slideshow on engaging on the OFF Act. 
Now, we've got three main opportunities for engagement. Number one, 2018 is an election year. And it is going to be every member of the House of Representatives. There's going to be Senate members. And many states are also going to be having races in their House and possibly their Senate. Food and Water Watch has developed a candidate pledge where candidates pledge that when they are elected, they will support the off act or potentially if it's a state candidate, they would introduce the off act. Now, how powerful are candidate pledges? Well, if you ask anybody in Virginia, they're going to tell you they're very, very, very powerful. In Virginia, we had a group that started a candidate pledge that was uh, saying they would not take any money from Dominion Energy. 20 candidates signed this pledge, and these were 20 candidates that no one had ever heard of before. 15 of those 20 candidates won. Candidate pledges help you if you've got a collection of candidates and they all sound good. This helps you figure out who are the best candidates on climate. Now, currently elected members of Congress. If your representative is currently not a co-sponsor of H.R. 3671, the Off Fossil Fuels for a Better Future Act, then what we're going to need to do is visit their office and call their office, and we're going to need to ask them to become a co-sponsor. Um, this bill is 3,671. That means this was the 3,671st regular bill introduced in this session. So there's a lot of bills. Sometimes our more progressive legislators are not on the bill because they missed it. They're not aware that it's there. So it's our job to educate them and make sure they know, make sure they know that the bill is there. If your representative is currently a co-sponsor of H.R. 3671, ask them to be a vocal supporter to tell people and their colleagues why they supported this bill. One of the things that I always say whenever I'm talking about the OFF Act is I always remind people there is no planet B. We've all heard, well, you should have a plan A and a plan B. That's a great idea, but we don't have a planet B. So we need to do everything we can to make sure we take care of the one and only planet that we have. Now, the third opportunity for engagement, and this is a really big one because not enough people know that the OFF Act exists. There's a lot of people who know that climate is a problem, especially frontline communities, but we need to make sure people know that there is a solution so that they can join with us and they can engage. So your friends, your family, your neighbors, I'm assuming there are very few people on this webinar who live alone in caves. You know people, talk to them about the OFF Act. If you are inclined, Food and Water Watch and other organizations, we will be more than happy to work with you on organizing a town hall. If you are doing a candidate forum, make sure you plant a question on the OFF Act. If you are a member of a church or a religious organization, make sure that there is an opportunity at some point to engage people, members of your congregation on the importance and morality of protecting the climate. If you are a member of a political committee, and there are many of them that are very, very active now, make sure the members of your committee are aware 
that this legislation exists. And there's always the old fashioned, if you're just sitting down and having coffee or libations with your friends, let them know that this exists. Um, I'm also going to go over very, very briefly some legislative tracking tools because I'm hoping when we all start engaging on this, we are going to start seeing the number of legislators on this bill really start to tick up. Now, there are basically two main types of tracking tools. There are tools that only track the bills. They let you read the legislation and keep track of the numbers of legislators that are on it. And then there are also tools that allow you to track the legislation and then post your support or your opposition to the bill. That is another way through social media where you can get information out about these bills. Now, um, I'm going to send this PowerPoint to Food and Water Watch and we'll hopefully come up with a place where if you want it, you'll be able to download it and then have all this information. But I've got four of the websites and I'm going to actually show them to you in a moment just so you can quickly see what they look like and see the difference between one that's just letting you track bills and others that are allowing you to make comments on bills. So I've got my web browser already and we're gonna go take a look at I want to look at first. All right, actually, we're going to go take a look at GovTrack. This is probably one of the websites that I use the most for tracking bills. You can get a summary of the bill. So if you have questions about the bill, you can look at the summary. You can read the entire language of the bill. And this one is always important for me who are the members of Congress that are currently co-sponsors on that bill? And if there is a bill or a companion bill in the Senate, when we have a companion bill, we'll be able to see that companion bill right here on the screen. So this is GovTrack. Now I'm going to switch over to something called Popbox. Popbox is one of those websites where not only do you have the ability to read a summary of the bill, if you have a website, you can get free widgets that you can put on your website so that as information changes about the bill, number of co-sponsors or various other things, you'll be able to see them. And this is a website where you can begin to track support or lack thereof for a bill. Now, when I looked at the off act on Popbox, I was rather surprised to see that nobody had made a comment either supporting it or opposing it. And one of the things you can do when you make a comment is you can immediately post your comment on social media so that other people can see oh, wait a minute, I never knew there was such a thing. I know this group, what are they saying about it? So there are going to be many, many opportunities. And as I said, this is going to be a marathon. It is not a sprint. This is the first of a series of webinars that are going to be offered, not the last. So thank you very much. And I'm going to turn it back over to you, Katie. Thank you so much, Andrea. And thank you to all of our panelists uh, for your great insight and uh, information.
Uh, and as Andrea said, there are a lot of really great ways to get involved. To ask your representatives to co-sponsor the OFF Act, you can go to offfossilfuels.org and navigate to the OFF Act section of the website. You can also find other ways to volunteer and get involved in that site. And we will also follow up with everyone uh, with a sign-up page and a toolkit and in instructions for recruiting others in your area to join a meeting um, with your representative. And that toolkit will have everything that you need, a section-by-section -section summary of the OFF Act, the organizational sign-on letter that you can download and print, or a couple questions in the chat about endorsing groups, uh, along with step-by-step -step instructions for setting up a meeting if you're new to this type of thing. Uh, and if you'd like more information to get involved in one of the state campaigns um, that Scott talked about a little while ago, um, got a bunch of different state level off act bills. Um, you can go to the same website offfossilfuels.org and navigate to the get involved section. And we have details on each of the state bills and an organizer that you can contact there. So next we'd like to take um, a quick poll of the audience here tonight. We have just a couple minutes left. Um, so I'm going to launch this poll so you all should be able to see this on your screens uh, if you're joining us on your computer. And the first question that we have is, are you involved in local campaigns to help the transition to renewables? So you can click yes or no to answer that question. And the second question is, would you like to get involved in efforts to pass the OFF Act? Again, you can answer with a yes or a no to that question. So please just take a minute now, answer those questions and I'll announce the results in a moment. And uh, a reminder, if you have any questions, to pop those in the Q&A, and we'll get to as many as we can after this. We only have 12 minutes left, so we'll do some rapid fire questions. I'll give folks another moment. So are you involved in local campaigns to help the transition to renewables? And would you like to get involved in efforts to pass the OFF Act? And I'm realizing that the questions I have written down are slightly different than the ones you may have seen. So hopefully that was a, something to just make sure you were all paying attention. Um, looks like we've got lots of folks answering those questions. Um, great. So let's wrap this up. Thanks again for everyone answering these questions. And let's see what we've got. We've got, um, 64% of our audience um, can help get your member of Congress uh, to co-sponsor the OFF Act by scheduling an in-person meeting. That's awesome. And then second question, we have 94% um, uh, of, our, of our audience can help the transition to 100% renewable energy by volunteering on a state or local campaign. Excellent. Any reactions from our panelists on those results? Yeah, this is Scott. No, that's wonderful. Um, like I said at the beginning, it, it, it's going to take all of us to get this done. It's, it's a heavy lift, and, and it's wonderful to see the numbers that are coming up. So thank you. And I agree, Scott. Very, very, very exciting that whenever we go into something like this, you do need an army of dedicated people literally pushing this boulder up this 180 degree mountain. Absolutely. Um, great. If I may also yeah. just from the union perspective, I got to put a plug in there. I know it's sometimes difficult, but where the opportunities present themselves, um, uh, if I, I would encourage folks, if you're in a union, obviously to bring it up in your union, but to look for opportunities um, to uh, relate with, uh, with union folks. Um, Oftentimes, we'll find them at the, uh, my union brothers and sisters on the opposite side of an issue, a local issue, but there's always good folks. And if we, we need to make inroads anywhere we can, I know I'm happy to serve as a resource uh, any way that I can. Um, but I encourage, we're talking about activism and finding ways to, to advocate, try to find ways into the local labor movement and as much as possible. I just got to put that plug in, so thanks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. Um, so let's move on to uh, some Q&A. We have a lot of questions. I will tell you right now, we won't be able to get to answer all of them tonight. We'll try to do our best to follow up if you have any questions um, after the fact, if we can track you down uh, over email. Um, first question I'm going to go to is um, one from that we had over the, the chat tonight. Um, 
so there was some some comments about um, market based mechanisms um, for mitigating climate change. Um, the question is, um, it, it could seem like a promising first step um, to address climate change. So um, why is carbon tax and dividend not a solution? Um, why, do, why do we feel that? And um, can, can you kind of explain the arguments against it? Scott, do you want to take that? Sure, sure. Um, no, it's, it's a very good question. Um, it's important to remember that these pricing systems, whether it's cap and trade and carbon tax, and there's differences, or fee and dividend, which is a form of a carbon tax, actually began as conservative and industry-driven approaches to avoid regulation. And, and so back in the 70s, it was a Bush senior uh, a staffer, a lawyer, industry lawyer, that came up with cap and trade uh, along with EDF. And, and if, uh, it was back in 2008, 2009 that uh, Rex Tillerson, who was then CEO of, of ExxonMobil, really pioneered the idea of carbon tax and ExxonMobil, who, who has been behind a carbon tax, because they understand that what, what taxes and cap and trade do is it really puts a burden on consumers to fix this problem. And it's all based on this notion that if you just make these little market adjustments, then the free marketplace will kick in and wonderful capitalism will kick in and it will solve all of our problems. Well, we know that, that those systems leave a significant portion of our population behind in the dust and in soup and, and pollution and all other kinds of, of messes. Um, the, the notion that you put a price on carbon, whether it's $20 a ton or $30 a ton or $40 a ton, simply means that consumers will pay a little bit more for gas, a little bit more to heat their fuel oil, and ExxonMobil will continue with business as usual, and that's why Rex Tillerson supports the carbon tax. We've looked, and if you go to our website, Food and Water Watch's website, we have looked very carefully at the British Columbia carbon tax, which was enacted back in 2008, and was, it's still in place, and it's been in place for years. Um, no emissions reductions resulted from the carbon tax. Gas prices went up, home fuel prices went up, um, and, and there were no e emissions also went up, by the way. Um, we don't have time. And, you know, you could eventually price fossil fuels out of the marketplace. 200, you know, I pull into a gas station and gas is $100 a gallon, then I'm probably not going to put fuel in my car. Of course, I can't get my kids to school, and I can't get to work, and I can't do all those other things. So it's highly regressive. Um, but th that's not what we're talking about here. The, the big problem is when, when folks say, well, it's, at least it's a step in the right direction. If our legislators at the state and federal level pass a carbon tax, that will not be the first step, only the first step, that will be the last step. They will not entertain the real kinds of reduction mandates that we need because they think they will have done their job. And we, as we see in British Columbia, it's not gonna fix our climate problem. It's just gonna burden um, working in middle-class families and not change industry behavior at all. So we're very skeptical of a carbon tax. And again, go to our website and you can read our, our analysis of the British Columbia uh, report. Hey, this is Ben here. I just want to chime in um, on everything Scott said, but definitely second everything I was just said. I think also just coming, you know, looking at this at carbon pricing, um, kind of a bit more broadly than just the carbon tax perspective itself, but I think including that obviously, extending to cap and trade as well. I think like if, especially if you're looking at this from the perspective of um, impacted communities from working from low income folks from you know folks living right next to power plants who just need to stop having poison pumped into their air like right now carbon pricing of both you know revenue neutral uh, and cap and uh, sorry carbon tracks carbon taxes or cap and trade all the different variations thereof really doesn't do anything if much of anything to address like the very immediate fact that like people are particularly people of color and low-income folks are getting poisoned, are having to live with co-pollutants um, on just an unimaginable and inhuman scale. Um, in large, and in large part, um, it can even intensify that. Um, because again, if, if you're just putting a price on carbon, those with enough resources can just pay, continue to pay to pollute. And so the uh, uh, plants that they decide to keep paying to pollute, because they're most expensive to replace, are often the dirtiest, they're often the oldest, and those ones are also most likely to be located in uh, environmental justice communities and low-income communities and communities of color. So I think also from an equity and justice standpoint, in addition to all the really excellent points that Scott brought up, like uh, carbon pricing is really not uh, a viable path uh, forward. Thank you, Ben. 
All right, I unfortunately only have time for one more question. I wanna make sure that um, we respect folks' time tonight. Um, there's a question um, that, we, that we got from Northern Virginia. Um, we just selected many progressive delegate, delegates who've introduced many new climate bills. Given the legislation is still in control of Republicans, um, what action should we take to ensure these climate bills pass? Uh, Andre, do you wanna take that one? Um, Virginia introduced a uh, number of these Reggie bills, which we certainly do not support, but today the OFF Act was introduced in Virginia. It is HB 1490, and it is described as a moratorium on fossil fuels. The delegate that introduced it is Sam Razul, and Sam Rizul was the only elected member of the Virginia General Assembly that signed the Dominion Pledge saying he would not take money from Dominion. So unfortunately, these Reggie bills have been introduced in both our House and the Senate, and one of our jobs is going to be to educate our friends on why this is unacceptable. Great, thank you so much. Um, any last words from our panelists before we wrap up? I would say take heart. Uh, we, this is an organizing project this, and this bill is a very, very powerful vehicle. We can use it in our various sectors and, and uh, working groups and uh, and, and communities. We, uh, we have a beautiful tool here and I hope we use this uh, moment as a, a, jumps, a jumping off point to really step it up. Great, that's a great point to end on. Um, thank you all so much. Um, and again, you know, we'd love to get everyone involved in building support in Congress for the Off Fossil Fuels Act. Um, we'll follow up with instructions on how you can do that and if you're in one of the states where we have uh, state le level legislation, like in Virginia, to transition to 100% renewables, we will point you in that direction as well. We'd love to plug you in. Um, thank you so much to everyone um, for spending some time with us this evening, to all of our panelists. We couldn't do any of this work without such an incredible network of activists and allies. So that's it for us tonight. Thank you for joining and, and on to the clean energy revolution. Great. Thank you. Good night. Good night.